I can't hear you. Um, I think the I think in the comment probably the fact that the, the proof why that you need the Japanese modified proof is like going bigger. Yeah, it's something something like that. As you can see, she's there shopping and the fly is shopping too. And in the bubble it says, if the fruit isn't genetically modified, explain the fruit fly. So you get the joke. It's like a joke. Okay. Okay, well, our first group up is going to be Saman Cody. That's noon sophomores, okay? Uh, we're gonna be doing the introduction to genetic engineering. My name is Samas Said, and here's my partner, Cody Rivera. Hello, sophomores. Sophomores, okay. First of all, for those of you who don't know what genetic engineering is, it's a simple process. It's taking a gene from one organism and putting it into another. On the left picture, we have a scientist taking a gene from one organism or a living thing and putting it into another living thing. On the right, we have a video we're going to show you. Bacteria have small loops of DNA called plasmids. What DNA do we have to send you? Okay, we're wrong. Can you put the speaker in here? Technical difficulties. Say hi, Chloe. Bacteria have small loops of DNA called plasmids. In genetic engineering, plasmids can be cut open with restriction enzymes, and DNA from other organisms can be inserted. By specific nucleotide sequences at which they make cuts in the DNA molecule. They cut in such a way as to leave jagged ends with unpaired bases. These are called sticky ends because they will hydrogen bond to complementary nucleotides. A section of foreign DNA with the appropriate bases on its own sticky ends can bind to the plasmid, and DNA ligase helps join the ends. The result is recombinant DNA. Okay, so what we just saw was this circular piece of DNA which is the piece of DNA that's only found in bacteria. Normally in other organisms, the DNA is linear. But in this example, the circular DNA from bacteria is useful because it's easily, it's easily transferable between the bacteria and it's easy to insert genes into it. Next, we're going to talk about restriction enzymes. As you already know, enzymes are proteins which are used to speed up reactions. So in this example, the enzymes are going to be opening up or are going to be cutting up the DNA. So on the left side, there's one organism's DNA, and on the right side is another organism's DNA. And then in the middle, uh, you see that the bases, the bases match up. So then the same restriction enzymes are going to be combining the DNA, and the result is recombinant DNA, which is again uh, DNA which is combined from two different living organisms. Here we have a table of the different uh, products which are approved by the FDA for human therapeutic use. So, for example, medicines. At the top, you don't need to really know all of them, but I'll just go over a few, like human insulin, which is uh, used with the host of E. coli bacteria, and is used to treat diabetes. Another example is follicle-stimulating hormone, which is used with Chinese hamster, hamster ovary cells. They use these cells as the host for expression, and they, use, they produce the follicle simulating hormone for infertility. Okay, you probably didn't even know what I just said, but I'll talk about insulin. Insulin, what, insulin is produced by E. coli bacteria. They take the human insulin gene from humans, from like a human cell, and they insert it into the E. coli bacteria's genome, so the, the DNA of the E. coli. Once it's inserted into the E. coli, the E. coli is able to produce the human insulin. So there's a bacteria producing the same human insulin that your own body makes. And this is actually the first product made by recombinant DNA technologies ever since 1979. So Ms. Daniels was telling us that farmers have been doing this for a long time, but this was one of the first examples 
where they actually took uh, two different organisms and, and inserted one organism's DNA into the other to produce products for humans. Another example is the human growth hormone, which the pituitary glands produce to um, provide normal growth. So the reason why they produce this, the human growth hormone, which is again produced by the E. coli bacteria, they do it for patients who don't have normal growth. So if somebody has some kind of growth disorder, they would use this human growth hormone, which they have producing by the bacteria, and give it to the patient to uh, regulate his growth or her growth. Next, like I said, uh, which was on the table before, follicle stimulating hormone, which is produced by ch Chinese hamster ovary cells. They use these mammal cells specifically because they're, it's more efficient for the protein folding. The follicle stimulating hormone is used to treat infertility in both men and women. So in the woman's case, when there's a too low FSH, it means that there's problem with uh, there's problem with conception, so it's difficult for to get pregnant for the woman, and uh, for men, when there's a when there's low FSH hormone, then uh, it usually means that the body isn't producing sperm, so which is also another issue for which causes infertility. And then finally, on the bottom we have hemoglobin, which is again produced by E. coli. As you may notice, E. coli is very commonly used for genetic engineering. The, the hemoglobin is the protein in blood which carries oxygen throughout the body. So the benefit of this is that they give it to patients who need blood transfusions. They're starting to do this. So instead of having to wait for donors to donate blood for people that need the blood, they can start using the hemoglobin which they can produce through the bacteria and to give it injected into the patients without having to wait for a donor. So it's much more efficient than the traditional way. All right, for you visual learners, because I don't like words. In the top, well, this is the human insulin process. Um, in, the, in the top, we start off with the human pancreas. Cells are taken out cont containing the insulin cell. From that cell, there's a strand of DNA that's taken out containing the insulin gene, which is cut up. On the other side, we have the bacteria with the plasmids, as Sama said earlier. It's taken out of the bacterium cut open using the restriction enzymes, and then joined in the bottom. This is recombinant DNA. The plasmid is now containing the insulin gene, which is inserted back into the bacterium, and the bacteria multiplies the insulin used to treat diabetes. Um, so I was going to do a second example of human hemoglobin. Okay, very similar to the previous example, this is again outlining the process of genetic engineering. So on the left we have the plasmid or uh, the E. coli bacterium cell and the first thing that they do is that they remove the plasmid which is like I said the circular piece, piece of DNA which only bacteria have. So much work. They remove the plasmid and then and they cut it open with one of the restriction enzymes and then they take a cell from example from the bone marrow which has the hemoglobin gene activated because it, it makes the blood cells. They take out the DNA and isolate the hemoglobin gene, which is the piece of DNA that will eventually transcribe and translate to produce the hemoglobin. They isolate the hemoglobin gene and insert it into the plasmid with the use of restriction enzymes. Once these two, D once these two organisms have the, uh, once, they, once the hemoglobin gene actually is introduced into the uh, E. coli bacteria's DNA, that's the recombinant plasmid, the circle piece. Then it's reintroduced back into the bacteria, which means the bacteria now has a hemoglobin gene, and it can it now divides to create more bacteria, and it's eventually put into fermentation tanks to keep the supply, and the bacteria consistently uh, produces the hemoglobin. So once they have this hemoglobin, they have it for a medical use, so they use this hemoglobin to inject into the patients, like I said before, which... Uh, would need blood transfusions because this is an alternative to blood transfusions. The FDA was asked, what do you think is genetic engineering? They simply said a process in which recombinant DNA or RDNA technology is used to introduce desirable traits into living organisms. Recombinant DNA is simply a genetic engineered plasmid with a gene from a different or foreign living thing. Genetic engineering microorganisms 
can be used to make traits more efficiently and quickly. Quicker. Okay, here are just the websites that we use to research our information. Are there any questions? Yes? Why do they use the E. coli bacteria for so many types of genetic Over here, or way down there, can you guys hear me? Yes? No? Good, we're good. Nod your heads, make waves. Yes! 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 Today, me and Corey are going to be talking about genetically modified food crops. So, this is Corey McCall and I'm Alejandro Moreno. So, um, what's the term for GMOs? Ms. Daniels already went over that. Well, it's a genetically modified organism, which means it's any organism that had its genes or chromosomes modified somehow in any way. It's <clears throat> the new gene is usually comes from another organism uh, but, or a totally different organism. So what are genetically engineered crops? Uh, basically genetically engineered crops um, have had foreign genes usually from uh, another crop or a bacteria or another organism inserted into the chromosome. As you guys know, we know it as DNA inserted into the, their DNA, the organism, the host organism, was a, to add a desirable trait. So, um, steps for creating genetically modified crops. So, this yellow strand of DNA right here is the plant, the plant's DNA. This is the bacteria or the desirable trait from another organism, or whatever you want to call it. So what they did using uh, cutting, they cut the plant's DNA in anywhere they want, and they cut the desired trait from that one bacteria. They take that, they, they just put it into the plant's DNA, the host DNA. Now using uh, restriction enzymes, they, they, these are called sticky ends, to put the that blue strip, the desired DNA, into the other one, which is the plant. And then it's, it's called recombinant DNA when it's put back together. And then they reintroduce the desired trait in the host DNA into the plant cell, planting it, and then getting the genetically modified crop or plant with the desired trait. You guys get it? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, no? Yeah. Got it? Yeah, no? Any questions? No? Right. Passing it off to Corey. Alright, here's a list of foods that have been um, approved. <laughs> here's a list of foods that have been approved and in commercially grown in the United States for human consumption. There's some corn, soybeans, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, papaya, squash, wheat, tomatoes, and chicory. Have you guys ever had any foods on a weekly basis? No? No, show of hands? You guys are dead. One? One person eats meat. Two? Everyone's eating corn. Oh, yeah. Where's chicory? Chicory? I don't even have a picture of chicory here, but it's like a simple plan. And some of the traits that the uh, cross might have, they're pest resistance, meaning like insects can't eat them because they're toxins, they bite them. Uh, herbicide tolerance, they could take a Ronald Brady, which is a certain kind of weed killer. They have bar resistance, so they can't get diseases. Drought resistance, they can grow in federal countries as in Africa, dry weather like India. They're frost resistant, increase nutritional value, improve food, and alter ripening. And uh, I'm going to tell you a story about um, the papaya. They have, they've been um, viral resistant because back some time ago in uh, Hawaii, the papaya almost got wiped out all farmers because it got some disease. 
and they wiped out all the papaya. So now they're genetically modified them so they can borrow resistance. They're back on their feet and the farmers is growing them again. So that's pretty cool. Um, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the organisms that supply the genes for desirable traits is many kinds from bacteria plants and the food sections from geese, insects, fish, and mammals. And here's uh, with the corn. Here's the BT gene. And it's, it's a toxin gene to us uh, caterpillars. I'm going to tell you. And what they do is they, with uh, restriction enzymes, they cut, it, they cut this part out, leaves a sticky end. They take this gene and they stick it into the corn. So now the corn is uh, viral resistance. I'm not viral resistance. It's uh, toxic. And I'm going to talk about it on this, the next slide. This is a pretty cool one because this is one of the first commercially grown food ever. This was uh, happened around the 70s, they was working on this. And they got approved for license in about 1994. And what they did was they, uh, they altered the, uh, the shelf life. So they, they added a gene into it that made it last longer. So after it comes off the, uh, the vine, it'll last longer. So it said there's a gene in here that, um, that makes it rot. And they replaced that gene so it wouldn't rot. And as I talk about the corn with the roundup ready. Stay. Alright. Stay. Roundup ready is a, it's a type of wheat clay that all farmers use nowadays. And what they did was they took the corn and I showed you what they beat. They, um, they, took, they took the corn and they, uh, they made a resistance to wheat killer. And then the, that BT I was talking about earlier, they put that in the corn so like caterpillars can eat them. This very high caterpillar is not eating that corn or he's going to be one dead caterpillar. <laughs> and the FDA, they don't require labeling because they feel like the uh, only thing that's different is genetic makeup. Everything is the same. Like the nutrition, the value, everything. So they said it shouldn't be labeled because the only thing that's different is genetic makeup. But the nutrition is the same. I want to play this video for you guys. I think there should be labels on GMOs for sure, just so that people know what they're buying. Labeling is good, but it can be a little bit too much sometimes. I, I want to do right by my family, I want to make good decisions, but it's just all, you know, a little bit too much sometimes. I think it should be labeled. I think people have an absolute right to know what they're putting in their bodies. What's so different about this food? I mean, why do I need all this extra labeling? The FDA has said that if the nutritional content of a food produced through biotechnology is identical um, to a food that's produced conventionally, there is no this? For I, go to my power. I agree completely with the FDA. They've also said that if there are differences in the nutritional value uh, or content of a food, then it should be labeled. And again, uh, I agree completely with the FDA about this. You know, there are so many things that people worry about, and you reach a point where there are so many labels that things that would be really important, like household products that might cause harm, it gets lost in the shuffle because there's almost too much information. And it's, it's much more important to label items that might truly cause harm than foods that have been used for 20 years in 29 countries and consumed by millions and millions of people, including pregnant women and children, over nearly two decades. Labeling for me is very important on foods. It helps me understand <clears throat> the nutritional value uh, of the nutrients in the food, and it also tells me what nutrients are in the food. Um, if I'm allergic to something, I'd like to know that the food that I'm eating doesn't contain what I'm allergic to. So there are many uses for that label. If I'm eating a food produced through biotechnology that's the same as a conventional food, then there is no information on that label that's going to be helpful to me. Guys, you understand what you were saying, the last part? Yeah. 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 Alright, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, have any questions for us? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.
Thanks. Next up is Jane Camby, and she's going to be talking about what are some of the benefits of genetically modified foods and crops, and what are some of the risks or perceived risks associated with this technology. Jane? As you can see, these are some examples of this food that they've genetically modified. This is flavor no, I don't want to. This is the flavor saver tomato. And this is um, the food crop, I mean, corn crop. And this is actually a palm that they genetically modified. And this is golden rice that Kobe, Corey, and Alex are talking about, and I will later on in my slideshow. And this is some canola. Um, some environmental, environmental risk is kind of contamination of non-genetically modified crops, which means when you have a crop that's already been genetically modified and a crop that hasn't, it can cross contaminated. And as you can see in this picture, it kind of goes through it. It says cross pollination occurs when pollen from one plant leaves lands on the silks of another plant. And some other environmental risk is um, insects become immune and also super weak. Um, super weed is a resistant weed that has um, been a major problem for farmers and it um, can change the ecosystem around them and also for farmers. And they have to use more spray, herbicide spray. Some benefits actually for genetically modified crops are that farmers use less pesticides and that it can um, ease the net impact on agriculture because sometimes when you have crops and stuff, you add on to the causes that are already harming stuff. So when you have genetically modified crops, it eases that. And right here, it says, you got to have the right genes, buddy. And you can see he has flies around him. And he doesn't have flies because he's genetically modified. And he don't get as many bugs trying to eat him off. Like that one would do because it's not genetically modified. Um, some health risks of GMOs is that it could create new allergens for people. Um, it can have a negative impact on human health, and it also can have an addition to toxins in your food. Some benefits is that it's more nutritious. It contains vaccines for um, like diseases or something, and it can, um, it supplies more food for the growing population, and that's actually a problem now. Hunger and poverty, and people not having enough food to eat. So, creating GMOs can actually supply more food for people. And this is golden rice. Um, it was created in 1999 with daffodils and this bacteria things in daffodils. It's a strain of rice, and they actually made golden rice too in 2005. It's more, it's like 23 times better. It contains more vitamin A. And um, unfortunately, it's not available for growth and consumption yet because of the controversy of GM crops. But within the next few years, it will be growing in the Philippines. This is um, a slide about vitamin A deficiency. It affects 118 countries, mostly in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, it's the leading cause of severe blindness and um, visual loss. It increases the risk of death and serious illnesses. And it impacts a lot of, a lot of children. And they will eventually probably become blind. But, When you have golden rice, if you eat golden rice, it actually stops effects of all this. So golden rice kind of eases that off. And then this is actually an experiment from a doctor that I found. Um, they found made majority of the studies done in animals and subjects reported no harmful effects from using GM foods. And that an independent research looked for all the published experiments of GM food safety. So there's really like, according to this, there's really no harmful things of genetically modified food. And these are my citations. that study that it may not be transferable to us? What's the problem with that study that <laughs> may be problematic? And maybe some of the 10th graders can answer that. Well, who do they do that testing on? Animals. They do, oh. Yeah. I mean, 10th graders, someone want to raise their hand and answer it? And Jocelyn. They did it on animals and not humans? Yeah. Well, they did it on animals. I mean, that's good, but the animals are not humans, so. Do animals have allergies or something? Okay. 
Any other questions or comments? No? Yes? Um, you talked about um, people developing allergies, uh -huh. genes genetically modified. Has that been happening? Yes, because stuff that they have in the food, some people can be allergic to. And if they're not allergic to, it can create allergies. So, really? Yeah. That's what they're finding? Uh -huh. Any other questions? No? Okay. I recommend that you use the microphone. I think I'm pretty loud. I think everyone in here knows that. <laughs> okay, so um, up next we'll be having Brandon, and he's going to elaborate on his topic. Good afternoon, sophomores. <laughs> my, my topic is transgenic animals and their benefits to humans. Like I said, my name is Brandon Davis. <clears throat> what is a transgenic animal? A transgenic animal has been genetically engineered to contain a new gene and Mice were the first to experience it and was most successful. And that they are also the most produced transgenic animal today, followed by rats, goats, pigs, cows, and then salmon. How transgenics are made, transgenic animals are made. A method that I found is called DNA microinjection. And what they do is they take a DNA solution into the pipette and put it into the female egg. As you can see, the pink stuff is the DNA solution and it is going into the nucleus of the female egg. And what they do is when it's put into the, when they put the DNA solution into the female egg, they then put it back into the female and then the female gives birth to the baby that produces or shows the traits that it was genetically engineered with. What transgenic animals are being produced for? They're being produced for agricultural, medical, and industrial reasons, and also for disease models so they can test diseases on them, like Alzheimer's, cancer, and all this stuff. Cows are genetically engineered so that they so that they can produce milk for us to consume naturally. But for those who can't, it's, they are lactose intolerant or have milk allergies. And for those who are allergic, the reason is because of wheat of the wheat protein that's in the milk. So what they do is they take that protein out in order for y'all to drink it. For those who are lactose intolerant, they um they basically just make the milk the milk human as possible. Like in the next bullet, it says that cows are genetically engineered to produce milk that is very close to human breast milk. So what they do is take these two enzymes, lysosine, which is the blue one, and lactoferrin, which is the red one, and put them into the cow's udders to produce a more human-like milk. And this is a scene, this is a video of what cow, of what goats and spiders, genes mix together and what they do. Enjoy. Thank you. 
This is a story about silk and milk. Silk is from golden orb leaf spiders. Here you go, pumpkins. They're incredibly inquisitive. They're a lot of fun. The milk from specially bred goats. Good luck trying to connect those dots. So what's the thread? There's a lot of interest in spider silk fibers because they're stronger than, than almost any other man-made fiber and they also are elastic. Because it's stronger ounce for ounce than other materials, there are many possible medical uses, from artificial ligaments to sutures for surgery. So the question is how you produce large amounts of the material. Spider farms just don't work. They tend to kill each other. So molecular biologist Randy Lewis figured out how to put the spider's silk-making genes into goats. What we did was put that gene into some goats in a situation where they would only make the protein in their milk. And when the goats have kids, and then they start lactating, what's the milk? And we can purify that protein in much, much higher quantities. With help from the National Science Foundation, Lewis studies spider silk at the University of Wyoming. And so far, Lewis says he's seen no differences in the health or appearance of the transgenic goats. Good girl, come on. Come on. I know, you don't want to go down. Feeding and milking goats and wrangling spiders are sometimes part of the job. So we collect the milk out here, and um, then we take it back to the lab for processing. The silk we're particularly curious about is the drag line. That's the outside of the web. It's the strongest part of the structure. Chemical engineer Heather Rothfuss separates the silk protein from the milk. No arachnophobia for her. In fact, she's actually warmed up to working with spiders. I'm on the moon now, so it's quite okay. Just four drops of protein processed from the milk can be spun into four yards of silk. Uh, so there will be a lot of applications, eye surgery, plastic surgery, nerve surgery. The lab is also introducing genes into alfalfa plants. So how do people react to this tangled web of a tail? They understand that you can't just farm spiders, so you got to come up with another way to make the material. No kidding. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. <laughs> This camera sticks a lot. Can't use zoom in a lot. So now I'm gonna talk about Salmon. Now Salmon Salmon is getting is being has been approved by the FDA and is now will be sold in supermarkets and now will be on our plates for dinner. So what they would do is they will take a Chinook Salmon DNA and a Ocean Pouch DNA, merge those two together and put it into an Atlantic Salmon DNA, which will make an Alqui Aqua Advantage Salmon. And the Aqua Advantage Salmon is the fish that is behind that small fish. But that small fish in front of it is the original salmon. So as you can see, it's two times bigger than the salmon, than the Aqua Advantage Salmon. And so in conclusion, this is, as you see so far, this is what they're doing with transgenic animals. And that there are many more, but they're still being studied. And so now, I think that if they keep doing this and experimenting with other animals' traits, and genes, and what they could do, they'll help benefit us later on in our future and make probably stuff more easier. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Brandon. Up next is a video by uh, Set Up For Me. Kiana, Melissa, and Ramon.
I like spiders. I do a you can do as many cartwheels as you want at home. Oh, what the hell? class did and then uh, we did it again just so we could show you a how-to video and we're gonna have audio uh, text things like that so <coughs> materials for step one nutrient agar distilled water
E. coli by adding 250 microliters of transformation solution into it. Then we dipped the loop into the rehydrated E. coli and made streaks on the agar starter plate. After stroking the plates, we inserted 250 microliters of transformation solution into the PEGLO plasma DNA. Step 4, the transformation. Materials for step 4. Transformation solution, pipette, loop, prepared plates, water bath, ice bath, micro test tube, foam tube wrap. We labeled the yellow microtube negative for negative P flow and labeled the purple microtube positive for positive P flow. Then we inserted 250 microliters of transformation solution into the positive P flow microtube and negative P flow microtube. We placed it in ice for 10 minutes. We scraped a couple colonies up with the loop and inserted it into the purple and yellow microtubes. Then we inserted the loop into the plasma DNA solution until a foam covered the loop. And put the loop into the positive PIGLO microtube. Then we put all the microtubes back into the ice bath for 10 more minutes. During the 10 minutes, we labeled the plates. Positive for LB amp era. Negative for LB amp. Positive for LB amp. And negative for LB. To heat shock the plasma TV. Brought the microtubes from the ice into a water bath for 50 seconds, that is 42 degrees Celsius. After the 50 seconds are done, we put the microtubes into the ice for 2 minutes. After the 2 minutes, we inserted 250 microliters of LB nutrient broth into all the tubes. Then we insert 100 microliters into the plates with this order. The positive PGLO solution is put on the positive LB amp and LB amp error plates. The negative PGLO solution is put on the negative LB amp and LB plates. After the plasmid is put on the agar, immediately spread it with the loop and close it fast to avoid contamination. Finally, stack all of the plates up, tape them together, flip them upside down, and put them in the incubator. If everything is done right, then the LB amp era under a UV light should look like this. It shows the bacteria contain the PGLO gene from the jellyfish. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, if, every, if everyone could just remain seated. What I want you to understand is that these seniors actually transformed bacteria. They inserted a new gene into the bacteria because obviously E. coli bacteria do not glow under UV light unless they have a gene inserted in them. And this gene happened to come from a jellyfish and that caused them to grow, to glow. So, Genetic engineering is not that difficult if you could do it in the classroom. So it's a pretty easy process. And we've talked about as sophomores how DNA is universal. So not only is it the same DNA in every living thing, the code is universal. So ACU codes for the same thing in humans as it does in every other organism. So the DNA molecule is the same, as well as the language of DNA is shared by every living thing on the planet.
Um, here's what I would like you to do. Um, you're going to enjoy this um, musical video about GMOs, and then when the bell rings, you're going to return to your classes and get your things. Okay? It's all public for he got bars. Your hairline. Oh. 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 Oh.